because it's been you know, around for a very long time, and there's a lot of assets that are trying to uh, leverage something like this, because it is actually very simple. You do not need uh, any external prompts. It's all passive, and uh, you can make this fairly cheaply uh, and distribute it everywhere. So it's um, so that's the positives of capillary driven microfluidics. And the way this works, these kind of devices, so this, for example, is a pregnancy test. And there are a few other tests that are, uh, have the same sort of format. For example, malaria tests and a lot of tests <coughs> for low resource settings are aimed to, to try to give uh, to uh, in this format. So the way this works is very simple. You have uh, lots of various sponges, basically, basically a porous media uh, that you can look at and model as a bundle of little capillaries. Okay? And what you have is that uh, in this uh, porous media, somewhere, you place antibodies towards uh, what you're trying to detect. And it could be antibodies, it could be other capture molecules, aptamers, things like this. Um, and on that antibody, they're usually, typically in this test, there's colloidal gold. That's how you read it out by eye. And so as, um, and somewhere downstream, you immobilize, again on the same porous material, uh, another antibody, and also another, uh, a test antibody. So what happens when you put your sample in here, the sample has an analyte. There is no, almost no sample preparation that occurs there directly uh, the sample has usually high concentration of analyte. I think uh, for this it's H is HGC, this hormone uh, that is increased during pregnancy. It's in very high concentrations. Uh, the fluid, because it has, uh, because the wet surface energy versus the dry surface energy is such that the balance of these energies uh, outweigh the viscous dissipation and the kinetic energy of the fluid, right? which is uh, driven by the velocity of the fluid. This fluid from the sample wicks through the structure and eventually catches those antibodies. Those antibodies, uh, some of them bind to your analyte. And then uh, they travel, they travel, they travel, and they hit one of these lines. And if you have the analyte there, the antibody binds to a secondary antibody and you have this nice line. Otherwise, if you do not have the antilite, these antibodies keep going, and then they go and bind on the line that's past it, and um, they give, they, they show that at least the test worked, that, uh, that, that there is antibody there, and this antibody is in a condition that it actually is able to bind, and the flow works. So this is how these things work. They're fairly simple. They're very cheap to make, but, um, and there's many other examples of these. For example, um, there's a growing field of paper microfluidics. It's slowly growing, but uh, it's growing in the lessons. You know, it gives these you know, three colors. There is also microfluidics on a string. You see papers come out of this once in a while. And same thing with cloth. Um, and the idea is the same. The medium is pretty much the same as this porous, fibrous medium, where you try to move fluids without any pumping very passively with just capillary flows and to confine the fluid you basically change the surface properties of your paper or your cloth uh, or whatever your medium is. For example by filling it with wax or by filling it with sugar um, then the sugar can dissolve and that can be formed these one-time valves that direct the flow. Uh, and there's lots of examples of this and so what are the, the advantages? It's just I said they're very low cost. Um, typically, they're targeted readout without any instruments. Sometimes they use a cell phone to make it a little bit more quantitative because the idea is in low research settings, uh, still folks have, a lot of folks have cell phones. So to make that a uh, little bit more quantitative. However, there are significant disadvantages to these as well. Uh, they're fairly difficult to design because um, you're relying on the surface properties of this paper. These surface properties often change. Uh, the surface properties of your sample, uh, or the wetting properties of your sample changes, maybe because of the disease state that the, the patient is in, or the sample that you're trying to detect um, is in. 
Um, and they make this fairly difficult to reproduce, so your flow rates might be different from time to time, so you have to keep that into account. Um, there's also a limited number of unit operations that are available. On this valve, it is typically very difficult. You have to rely on these kind of sugar valves that dissolve by the flow um, or dissolve by high enough flow or, and they can control timing, for example. Um, but there aren't very many other uh, unit operations that are available. And typically, because the readout is by eye or inexpensive optics, the sensitivity has, is pretty low and you can only pull out fairly quality of information. Now for things like the pregnancy test, you usually just need yes or no answer. You cannot really be half pregnant or quarter <laughs> pregnant. Um, so that's usually good enough. Uh, but if you want to try to measure an analyte and determine on that like how somebody is sick, and should we you know, provide treatment now versus treatment uh, later, we triage the person. It makes it fairly difficult. So the next uh, area of major area of microfluidics is droplet microfluidics. Um, and I know some folks here are very interested in this and are pursuing this. Um, this is a very interesting area of microfluidics. And uh, now, before we dealt with typically a single fluid. And here, typically what you have is you have multiple fluids. And typically in droplet microfluidics, the way you make droplets is there are tip, uh, two configurations. So either there is one configuration, which is your fluid that you want to be inside the drop, and you supply from this side in this T configuration the fluid that you want to be outside of the drop. And by controlling the relative flow rates of the two, you generate and you control the size of the droplets. For example, um, in this uh, case, what you have is that as uh, this fluid is slowly uh, let out of this uh, channel, this fluid, which is supposed to travel much quicker because you want to have uh, it more of uh, here, puts a drag force on this droplet and the capillary force here, uh, the force, uh, the surface tension between this fluid and also uh, the fluid that's outside, right, um, governs this, the force that on the snap that holds the thing together. And the situation is unstable because the larger this droplet, the more drag it experiences. And so you can uh, apply a significant flow rate and rip these droplets off in a particular size. And by controlling the, uh, the surface tension of these liquids, for example, by adding surfactants or adding uh, different surrounding liquids, for example, different surrounding oil, you're able to break off these liquids Oh. And so you can break them off, and you have very typically very very uniform droplet distributions, and you can do a lot of things with that, including the simplest thing. For example, if you have uh, this liquid has polarizable polymer. For example, monomers, you can shine some UV light, and out of this, you can generate very nice beads, very uniform, and you can tune the size of these beads on demand just by turning some knobs. So that's one major application of this. You can do this in a different fashion. Also, you can do this on the, with this cross structure, where um, you have a little bit more knobs that you can turn. For example, you can control these two fluids independently. And you can also control the geometry of these nozzles uh, here. Here is just a simple cross geometry. But um, here again, the fluid from here experiences a drag. And also from here, it experiences a drag that's a little bit more symmetrical. And uh, opposing that drag is again the capillary force holding this fluid together. And once this drag is high enough to overcome this, you get a droplet. And so by tuning the flow rates here, so uh, how much drag this experiences, you can tune um, the breakoff rate. And by tuning uh, how much you feed it through this channel, you can tune the size of these droplets. And you can, again, do this dynamic 
And so, so what can you do with this? So, uh, for example, you, if you want, you can also create this much uh, more complicated geometry, and where you focus another a third fluid inside these two fluids, and by that, by doing that, you can embed another fluid into this drop. So in this video, it happens to be that this fluid is miscible with this, but you can also <coughs> take an immiscible liquid and you can have stacked droplets. You have a droplet within a droplet within a larger field uh, fluid. So you have this kind of very interesting emulsion. And you can keep nesting this at least for a few layers. You can do this very interesting droplets, and again, if you polymerize this, you can get very interesting particles. So if you do not polymerize this, there's a very, uh, very interesting and very large application for droplet marking fluids, and that is droplet digital PCR. So for those who are not familiar with PCR, that's polymerized chain reaction. And what it is, is that polymerase is an enzyme, and the chain reaction is a chain reaction of DNA. So you have, you know, as if you remember from biology, you have DNA comes into strands, uh, they're complementary information, right? So it's same information, just opposite of each other. Um, and what you can do is you, you have to take these two strands, and you use this polymerase and enzymes to duplicate them. Right, so now you have four strands, and then you duplicate them once more, and once more, and so it's, you have this exponential growth, this chain reaction of DNA. And the nice part of, about that is that from something where you have very little DNA, because, um, for example, the thing you're looking for is fairly rare, like a pathogen in your blood, that the DNA of which you know, because you're looking for the particular pathogen, uh, you could use this to make the DNA now suddenly be very abundant, with fairly e simple reagents, uh, just an enzyme and uh, a few other reagents, say that, to keep it simple for now. And so um, what happens though, uh, what I described is a fairly ideal case where they duplicate and everything is nice. In the real world, this duplication is sometimes uh, not as efficient. So instead of uh, like, um, when you go, for example, from four to eight, you might actually get Eight, you might get uh, six, for example, something went wrong, one of the duplications didn't work. And so there, if you were to try to quantify uh, how much you started initially, you can't just uh, extrapolate logarithmically and say, oh, I had this many because now I have this many, because sometimes these efficiencies do not work. There is an interesting trick around this. Uh, using these droplets. So by doing using these droplets, you create <coughs> individual reactors. And um, of course, if you have a, a little DNA to start with, and you dilute it some more, uh, you can dilute it in such a way where you would uh, statistically get a single DNA strand, single piece of DNA in one of these droplets, right? And then uh, that DNA, of course, is there. You package it along with the correct enzymes and uh, correct uh, monomers and uh, other chemistry. And then you can start your amplification reaction. For example, if you do traditional PCR, you just cycle. Uh, or if you do non-traditional uh, PCR, you just heat, for example, to start the reaction. And only the droplets that have DNA in them have at least a single copy of DNA in them will start to show up to show that they have more DNA. And you can, there are dyes that intercalate DNA, and when they do so, uh, they start to grow, glow green, just like you saw here. Uh, but it's only specifically when they touch DNA. When they don't touch DNA, uh, their fluorescence is quenched, and, you don't, and they are a clear color. And so what you see is that you can just count uh, how many uh, droplets actually have fluorescence, actually have DNA in them, and then from that on, you just know how many copies you start with. It's very simple, uh, and you know how much you diluted, so you know how much was your original concentration in DNA. So this makes um, PCR very quantitative, and allows you to actually count. And so um, this is enabled by this droplet microfluidics reaction chambers. And so the advantages of this is that it's highly sensitive. You can actually pick up a single molecule. And it's highly quantitative uh, because you can actually literally count 
you don't have to, it's digital, uh, may, that makes it allows you to count this. But there is some advantage, disadvantages to this droplet microfluidics in that um, if you don't choose the surrounding oil uh, or surrounding phase uh, correctly, there is some leakage between the droplets that that can happen. And so it's not so much a concern with PCR or digital PCR, but there are concerns with other techniques uh, where your analytes um, have a mixed uh, polarity, I guess, and so they can be in both phases with uh, high probability in both phases, maybe like you know 80% in a droplet, but 20% outside the droplet, and so there might be mixing between the two droplets. And there's also um, a danger of the analyte being extracted out of the droplet uh, into the surrounding phase. Again, if it, at least with 20% probability, it likes the other phase uh, more uh, more than, for example, the phase that's inside the droplet. Okay. So the last major field of, uh, of microfluidics that I've talked about, and I'll talk about this now briefly, and then I'll start third session uh, of this talk where I'll dive into much more detail into this uh, uh, this particular field of electrokinetic microfluidics, and specifically it's uh, electrokinetic, but it's electroactuated microfluidics, and actually. Um, TIG is an example of electrically actuated microfluidics, right? You have lots of electrodes, uh, but those electrodes are terminated into a resistor, and by controlling the voltages that you put on these electrodes and the frequency at which you put on those voltages, you are controlling fluid flow in a print cartridge, for example. And so electro, uh, electrically actuated microfluidics is something that's uh, very familiar at HP. Um, and, but you can do a lot more things when you cut off that resistor and just use those electrodes for something other than uh, heat. So uh, here, uh, I'll just show you very briefly and then I'll start the next presentation uh, what you can do with electric kinetic microfluidics. So the simplest thing is you can do electrophoresis where you can separate uh, your analytes based on the ratio of the charge to their drag in a particular medium where you put in. And it turns out this is uh, this device uh, with this little chip, this takes little chips, uh, is called um, a bioanalyzer instrument. And so it's very hard to see, especially on the screen. It actually says HP uh, bioanalyzer. So this is an instrument that was built uh, prior to the HP Agilent sp uh, split and is now sold by Agilent. It's a very, very successful instrument to do uh, electrophoresis, in particular gel electrophoresis. And I'll explain how this all this works just shortly. Um, so this is an example of a DC, uh, direct current electrophoresis, or uh, electrokinetics, direct current electrokinetics, and uh, if you turn uh, from DC to AC, alternating current, um, you can get even richer field of phenomena where instead of uh, uh, relying on the charge of the particle, the charge of the thing that you're trying to separate out, you can also rely on their relative polarizabilities relative to the fluid. And using that, you can um, push the particles up and down and uh, just like you would in electrophoresis, and also separate things out that way. And I'll explain how that works very shortly. So just to give sort of a, a taste before I go into the depth of this, is that what are the advantages and disadvantages of this? So the first uh, advantage is that you're manipulating things with electric fields. And as you know, no electrical actuation is relative to other kinds of actuation for example, centrifugal, where you need a dedicated a motor and dedicated devices fairly easy. Um, the instrumentation for electrical actuation, the way we can apply voltages and currents is very much widespread. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive. We're very good at applying electric fields very, very precisely in controlling how we do this. Uh, we can apply them for a variety of time scales, for example, if it's fairly difficult to start a motor and stop it really quickly at like a megahertz time scale, 
it's fairly easy to do that to turn on and turn off the electric fields at a megahertz or even faster time scales with just inex relatively inexpensive um, instruments. Um, and it's also electrical actuation is very widely available. However, there are also some disadvantages like with all the other um, microfluidic fields and uh, devices. Uh, for DC microfluidics, you have uh, oftentimes unwanted electrical re electrochemical reactions at the electrodes, uh, which introduce chemical species. They can introduce bubbles, and that can introduce additional flows. Um, sometimes these are reactions you can actually leverage to do analysis. So sometimes they can be actually wanted. And also, uh, in both AC and DC, uh, you get heating. So here, we're actually leveraging that heating, uh, res this resistive heating to do pumping. Uh, but oftentimes, it's unwanted and causes all sorts of problems. 